Uh, please welcome all of you to the first uh, lunch seminar this fall. Uh, and I'm very happy to introduce the first speaker uh, for the fall. And it's, uh, now I have to check, Christina <laughs> Hök or Kia Hök yes. from yes. Uh, School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. And you work at Media and Interaction Design with uh, Soma Design. Yeah. which sounds very, very ex interesting. Yes. So uh, I'm glad to hear more for you. Uh, just a few things from, uh, for you in the audience. Uh, Christina will talk and there will be time for questions in the end. And this lecture is filmed. Um, so it's easier with the questions in the end. Uh, and then you will be able to speak also in the microphone. This is a microphone. So uh, <laughs> just raise your hand when you have questions and I will go around at the end of the speak. So thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, it's great to be here and really lovely to see so many people. So uh, as she said, my name is Christina or Kia Hök or hook, <laughs> if you have it difficulties with all the little dots. So I'm going to talk a little bit about soma design or somesthetic design. And uh, I thought rather than talking about it, we'll just do it together. So what if you sit up properly and put your sandwich somewhere else, uh, put your both feet on the floor and um, your shoulders in a nice position, uh, relaxing a bit. Put your hands on your thighs uh, <laughs> and then close your eyes. So we're going to take a moment just to, uh, to be here. Uh, we're going to have fun together and we're going to think about what it means to design with and for our bodies. So um, what if you start by turning your attention to your feet? How are they resting on the floor right now? If you turn to your right foot, how is that resting on the floor? Is it heavy or is it light? Is it pointing outwards or to the front or inwards? Turn your attention to your left foot. How is that resting on the floor? Is it heavy, light? And what direction is it pointing in? Now if you compare the two, are they the same or are they different? Now move up your attention to your calves, to your right calf, where is that today? To your left calf, and further up to your knees, your right knee, where is that today? Is that knee and the calf right above your foot? Or is it in front of or behind, to the left or to the right? And then turn your attention to your other calf, your left calf and your left knee. How is that resting on your foot? Is it in front of or to the left or to the right? And if you compare the two, are they the same or are they different? Now move up to your thighs. How are they resting on, on the chair? Are they heavy, light? The right one, how is that resting on the chair? And the left one? And now turn to your sitting bones. And maybe you don't know where you have your sitting bones. So if you lean just two millimeters to the right and then two millimeters to the left, can you feel your sitting bones? 
How are they resting on the chair? Are they heavy, light? Are they the same or different? Now, as you lean a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right and a little bit to the front and a little bit to the back, what if your chair follows you? So imagine that it's following you, it's rising and then lowering itself. And in fact, it's changing its properties. Uh, it's no longer cloth on top, it's actually leather. Or it is wood. Can you feel it? And now it's changing its shape entirely. It's, it's folding, it's unfolding, you know, it's around you now. Okay, we'll stop. This was um, <laughs> a super quick Soma design session uh, to do a shape-changing chair. No, <laughs> I'm not saying that shape-changing chairs is the thing we're going to see in the future. Maybe some, maybe, maybe not. Um, but the point of the exercise was to engage with what does it mean to really deeply feel something to really think about what are the aesthetics, what are the, the properties of this chair, and how could I change them? How could I work with that to change all the little fine nuances of the choice of material, of the choice of how the surface might follow you, how it could be a, like a robotic chair for you, and so on. Um, this is what we do. Uh, in, in the group I work with, we do all of these exercises where we um, engage heavily with our own bodies and with our own appreciation of our senses in order to bring out uh, quite different designs. So I'll, I'll take you through one of our um, design processes, the one that, that perhaps makes most sense. <laughs> we'll see what you say. Uh, we were super interested in, in starting from some kind of body practice, that, but then build something slightly different. And we tested all sorts of body practices. We were doing, you know, yoga and, and uh, kung fu. <sighs> <laughs> and we were doing uh, contact improv and all sorts of stuff. But in the end, we fell in love with something called Feltenkreis. So is there anybody in the audience ever done Feltenkreis? Yeah. <gasps> wow. It's not that common. What do you think? Do you like it? It's great. It's amazing, isn't it? So, um, so we decided to look at that because it was really, it's really about removing pain, about figuring out other ways of moving that can remove pain. But we were more interested in the fact that some of those exercises reconnects you with what it was to, to be a baby, to move. Or, or just in general, the pleasures of the fact that you have a body and you can move it. Uh, and it's also kind of interesting because it's very slow movement, so it engages you in a very, very slow, interactive process. So anyway, we did that. I'm going to show you a Feltenkreis lesson, my favorite one. And, and this one is done by a baby. And babies in talks are always good. They always make people happy. <laughs> so let's have a look at the baby doing my favorite Feltenkreis lesson. <laughs> Thank you. 
hard work. There's a lot of rest in the Felt in Christ lessons, right? So, why would you do this as an adult? What would be uh, the point of doing this? Well, <laughs> first of all, it's fun. Uh, I, s I especially like a variant of this where you hold on to your feet and you're rolling back and forth and it's just absolutely lovely. Uh, so it's fun, but uh, the reason that Feltenkrais did these exercises was in order to help you to find alternative ways of moving. And this particular movement is about if you're really fat and you have issues with turning over in bed, then instead of turning over by pulling your whole weight over, you use the combination of your hip, your shoulder and your arm in order to use gravity to instead fall over. So it's just a way of reminding you that there are many, many different ways that you can do your movements. Uh, so this is why he did it. But we were more, more interested in the fact that we had so much fun doing these exercises. So we did these exercises uh, once a week or, or so for, for quite a long time, all sorts of different uh, Feltenkrais uh, exercises. Um, and then we came up in, in, in a col collaboration with IKEA and some others, we came up with a few design concepts that are not necessarily implemented fel and implementing Feltenkrais as such, but more the enjoyment and the pleasures we got from these exercises. So the first one uh, we call the breathing light. So basically it's a lamp that follows your breathing. Um, so it's a very, very simple system technically. All it does is that it has a sensor that measures the distance between the lamp and your chest. So as you're breathing, the lamp will then be dimming in the same tempo as you're breathing. So it is not forcing you to breathe in a particular way, it is just following your breathing. Um, so here you can see one of our colleagues, uh, Johanna, as she's laying down underneath this lamp in a few seconds. Yeah, there she is. So she's breathing and the lamp is dimming. So you lay under this, this lamp and you close your eyes and it's absolutely lovely. Um, together with this, we designed a mat. And this mat, uh, what it does is just, again, very simple. It gives you instructions, a bit like I was doing before, uh, where it's asking you to focus on different body parts. And as you focus on those body parts, the mat will be heating up underneath that body part. So it helps you focus and it brings the attention to certain body parts uh, uh, as you go along. And this one is also amazing. It's so nice. I, I think maybe because we're in Sweden and it's cold or something. And so something that heats up like that is just fabulous to use. Um, so you can use these two uh, together. We designed a bunch of others. I'll just tell you one more that was uh, initially a failure and I'll ask you why it was a failure anyway so we put some sensors into the mat so as you're doing these super small movements perhaps turning a shoulder in a beautiful circle or something like that what the first version of the system did was um, to generate animations in the in the ceiling above you so as you're laying there and you're doing these super small movements you can see above you these animations that you can see here so here we have johanna again doing it um, so why was this a failure it looks beautiful and people loved it 
Why do you think it's a failure? No? <laughs> yeah, because if you open your eyes and you start controlling an animation, what you do is you focus on something on the outside rather than focusing on you and learning something about your inner experience. And that was our design aim. Uh, so we changed this one to instead generate a 3D soundscape. And the more harmonious the 3D soundscape was, the more uh, beautiful movements you had been doing uh, and more sort of uh, slow and controlled movements. So then, then it worked much better. So what is going on here and why, why is this some aesthetics? What do I mean by some aesthetics? Well, I borrowed the concept from uh, Richard Schusterman, a philosopher, and here he is in his golden suit. Uh, <laughs> he really loves art and part of his uh, research is also to do the things that he writes about. So here he's doing a, a some aesthetic experience. By soma, he's talking about the fact that we are subjective, living, purposive people. Uh, we are not body-mind divides. And this is a plague that we've had to deal with in the Western society for a long time. So he's trying to reunite body and mind into one by using a different word. So he talks about soma. So what does he mean? It's everything from how you move to how that makes you feel to how you think, to how you interact with other people and back again. As you know, the mind is in the body, the brain is in the body, the whole nervous system is actually in there. So there's no way you can separate these processes. But a lot of philosophy and a lot of design work has done uh, work where you sort of assume that the body is just this machinery of no importance whatsoever to your experiences. And that is obviously wrong. <laughs> So instead, he uses the word soma to talk about it. Aesthetics is one of those most horrible words that you can try to define ever. I don't know if you have a definition in, in your mind of what aesthetics is. It's for sure not about beauty. It's not about visual beauty. It is about something uh, way more <laughs> deep than that. So what he talks about is really about engaging fully with your senses in your activities to deepen your uh, uh, sensitivities to what you experience. So like now, for example, as you're eating your food, you can shuffle it in, choop, 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 done with, over. Or you can actually try to enjoy it. <laughs> you can eat slowly, <laughs> you can touch it, you can feel it, you can taste the taste of it, and thereby have a more uh, rich and interesting experience of, of your meal. I don't know how you feel about how you were eating now. <laughs> uh, so what he thinks is that when we do this, when we attend to our senses, when we engage bodily, emotionally and so on, we are actually engaging in the highest art of all, that of living a good life. <laughs> now, this usually annoys the hell out of a lot of people because who is he to tell us what a good life is? Uh, and I don't know what your position is on what a good life is. A lot of us perhaps live our lives as if the good stuff comes tomorrow, right? Or later, or when we retire, or when we go to heaven, or at some other point. Uh, what he says is, no, it's here. It's here. You can, you, you can live a good life here, but you have to be here. You have to attend to your senses and be here with others, with your body, with your emotion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another inspiration to me is just as a designer, you're always looking for ways of engaging the end user in the interaction. And so I was very inspired by another philosopher, Maxine Sheets Johnston, who is a dancer and a choreographer and a philosopher. And she talks about how the human morphology or any animal morphology is such that when we move, that spurs emotion and thinking and vice versa, thinking can spur emotion, can change your, your movements, right? You're with me. So, basically, if we want to create engaging interactions with technology, you can scaffold and try to make people move or experience or attend to their senses in certain ways in order to create for certain ways of interacting and being. Are you with me? It's a bit like... Uh, <laughs> convincing people, <laughs> so it's persuade, persuasive in that sense, but it's super, super interesting as a path. 
And of course, we already know that technology has done this to, to us. So I'm sure you all know, uh, if I ask you now, where is your mobile phone? You know exactly where it is. And you, if you feel it, feel it a bit, maybe you put it in a pocket and maybe it's a bit uncomfortable or, you know. So <laughs> the mobiles have already changed all your behaviors, right? Let's just walk, walk downtown and you'll see how everybody's like. You. So <laughs> how, uh, how was it before we had mobiles? So uh, I had a PhD student, Pedro Ferreira, who managed to convince me that he needed to escape Sweden during the winter time to spend some time in Vanuatu, some, some islands in the South Pacific, to study a culture where they didn't have any mobiles because he wanted to know what was going on. How do people communicate? How do they move and so on? But unfortunately, this last country on Earth that didn't have any mobiles, on the very day he arrived on in one of these islands, they got mobiles. <laughs> So instead of stud studying this culture without mobiles, he got to study a culture that was in change because of the introduction of mobiles. And he found a lot of cool stuff, but one of the things he saw was just how much it affected their way of moving. So before that, they didn't really have any private possessions except for a bush knife. Um, so this private possession now had to be placed somewhere in your hand or here you see this guy having it in a, in a string uh, dangling around his neck, right? So it needs body space. It takes up body space in order to be, to be with you. Uh, and <laughs> they live a lot on water. And so whenever they bent over to, break, you know, to take up something out of the water, the mobile would go into the water and pssst, it was gone, right? Or they would climb a tree trunk to get stuff and the mobile would uh, hit the tree trunk and poof, it's, it's gone. Um, or <laughs> he was climbing mountains together with these guys one day and one of the young guys fell and slipped on a cliff. And he, he held his mobile in one hand and he took the whole full impact on his chest. Like, boom! <laughs> uh, and was so happy because he had saved his mobile. So the rigidness of how you need to move and the way you have to think about what you can do, jumping into the water, cleaning yourself, falling over, whatever, has changed everything in, in actually how, what your body posture is and how you move. So we've already done this, but we've done a shitty job of it. <laughs> really, a shitty job. We're forcing people to look at this thing and I can see you, Mario, looking at your thing right now. <laughs> and <laughs> it's like, this distance to your eyes, so a lot of us are getting issues with our eyes. It is a glass screen through which we see other things rather than seeing what we have here and now, and so on. And I think a lot of the ways we've been designing is there's a wave of shit stuff happening through the digital technologies that we provided. Aggressions, uh, racism, populism, you know. Cambridge Analytica, all sorts of shit that we, <laughs> we should do something about. We need to find other ways of designing. We need to start with the human condition. What does it mean to have a body, to have emotions, to have thinking that, that uh, engages with that? Schusterman himself is, I don't know, an optimist. So he says that, yeah, yeah, but no technological invention will ever negate the body's centrality. Um, I think he's wrong. I think that these new media is change or are changing us. They're making us into a form of cyborgs uh, where we are no longer entirely in contact with bits and parts of uh, ourselves. And so um, I think we need to engage with the somasthetic design processes to remedy this. I'm just going to show you a few examples of other systems beyond the ones that we created, the, the soma mat and the breathing light. Um, so some that I think are good examples. So, for example, this work on uh, shape-changing materials to create dresses. Uh, here, these two dresses are actually changing. Uh, they're moving and changing depending on how you look at them, how other people look at you. So, so this movement is generated by <laughs> somebody looking at you, which is kind of cool. Another lovely example that I absolutely love is a friend of ours, Dag Svanes, who created himself a tail. Uh, so it's a belt that you put on. Uh, it has uh, accelerometers and so on in it. And as you move your hips, the tail will respond to it. So if you're moving, tick, tick, 
you get a bigger movement. So there are motors in the tail that makes it move and, and follow you. Uh, you. So you can do things like tilting your hips and it goes in between your legs and looks sad, right? And that movement actually does feel a bit. <laughs> so, um, so here's a friend of ours, Jody Felici from CMU, wearing the tail. Uh, so you can see how it works. A funny thing about this is when you put it on, it has this weight and you can feel it waving, though it's behind you. So you don't know exactly what it's doing, but it's kind of interesting. It's like a counterweight to what you do. Uh, so when you take it off, it feels like you lost your tail. Like human beings should have had a tail, I think. Um, another example is the bare skin connection. Um, so this one is by Mats Hoeby uh, in Malmö. He was in Malmö at the time. So he created this costume that this guy was wearing. And then he had um, earphones, headphones on. And then he had an extra pair that he would put on someone else. And then he would say, let me touch your aura. <laughs> <laughs> and then as he touched the other person's skin, it's a theremin. You know a theremin? This instrument that generates music by movement in thin air. In this case, he, you had to touch the other person, the skin of the other person, in order to generate the sound. So this is an excellent flirting device. Uh, <laughs> it works really well. Uh, another example is by um, people in Eindhoven who did... Um, uh, uh, remote control to control your music, uh, one of those iconic things that every designer likes to redesign. This one gives you haptic feedback, so you can touch it, squeeze it, shake it and use the button to change the music. Uh, but it also gives you haptic feedback and now the problem of course is that you can't feel the haptic feedback but you have to trust me when I say that it gives you feedback on the movements you do so you become in a completely different more uh, embodied relationship perhaps to uh, the choice of music yeah you get the point and then I thought because my my students are here <laughs> they were working with under the supervision of uh, Madeleine Balan uh, with Electrolux this spring, uh, creating a bunch of different design uh, ideas. And this is uh, one of the ideas. It's a thermochromatic color that you put on top of, of your uh, sink or whatever to make the cleaning more interesting. And so as you're cleaning, you're actually painting, you're creating different patterns on top of, of the sink. So it engages you in aesthetically cleaning your home. <laughs> right? Is that true? Yeah. So all of these, to me, they're sort of coming out of the somasetic theories, but they are bringing out different aspects. So it might be about extending your body, making you even richer in what you can experience, like having a tail. Uh, it allows you to do bare skin connection with other people. It allows you to go inwards and feel bits and parts of yourself and your movement. Uh, it can go into biofeedback loops, for those of you who know what, that are, what those are, uh, or the touch, some aesthetic touch of stuff. So it can basically be anything. Now I chose to show you some that were kind of provocative because that's more interesting, but I think in general I would say this works for anything. You could design anything with this. Anyway, how do you do this then? Well, so I tried to articulate that in a, in a Soma Design Manifesto. <laughs> so we'll see what you say. So um, first of all, I think we need to start designing as we're designing for being alive rather than dying. <laughs> so, basically going back to the old divide between Aristotle and Plato, Plato was talking about the ideal world, right? While Aristotle was sort of saying, well, let's live here and now. And Aristotle, if I understood it correctly, he would dance every morning all the way into his old age because he thought that living a good life means educating yourself in every sense of the world, including moving and dancing. So we should not be designing to make people more efficient, necessarily. What is this shitty efficiency idea we have? Uh, it's just harming us, right? And, uh, of course, we shouldn't design bad interfaces that make people uh, you know, not be able to complete the stuff that they want to do. 
But we shouldn't design as if everything is about saving minutes and seconds to do something else. <laughs> the interaction itself should be interesting. Um, and we should be designing to move the passions in others as well as we move the passions in ourselves. Uh, and I think we need to recognize that we cannot focus our design processes only on language and symbols as we do right now, uh, only addressing that side of who we are. Of course, language and symbols are super important to who we are. You know, the, good, the, the interesting thing about people is the complexities of our language. But we also actually do have a body. And we use our bodies before we learn a language. It's more fundamental to who we are than the language is, I would say. So we are movement through and through. Even when we just sit and think, as you guys are doing, you're actually still moving. If you weren't, <laughs> you would be dead, right? So your heart is moving, your muscles are moving, and so on. Um, we should be allowed to design with ourselves. If it doesn't matter to me what I'm designing, if I'm not willing to wear it myself or engage with it myself, then uh, it's not going to work for anyone else either. So we need to work with empathy and compassion and with ourselves. Uh, and we design slowly. This is the other big plague that some of you who've been through the training at KTH or who've engaged with the designerly thinking, you're used to design processes where you go chum, 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 generate an idea, twist it around, another idea, ch -ch -ch, implement it, done, right? What is this shit? Why would that generate good ideas? I don't know. This whole idea of commodifying design into a brief design session of 45 minutes, what is that? Ech. Design slowly. If you're going to do something of importance, then you need to engage and you need to educate yourself and change yourself and be some aesthetically aware. So, cultivating your aesthetic appreciation. How do you change yourself to engage with this? Um, so, this and, this and the last one, the disrupting. I'll, I'll go to just quickly a little bit more on what, what we do. What do we do at work uh, in the mid group? Um, so let's start with this uh, cultivating your aesthetic sensibility. So one of the things we do is we slow walk in the forest behind KTH, for example, in order to engage with our senses, with our walking, with our feeling of nature and so on. We do, uh, as I said, Feltenkreis exercises. We do um, uh, contact improvisation. We touch one another, very, very embarrassing, but <laughs> it sort of helps to understand what it means to be with someone else. Um, I, think, I think this might be you, Charles, hanging upside down, is it? I didn't do this one. Uh, that scares the hell out of me. But yeah, why not do some of the extreme uh, stuff as well? Whenever we do one of these exercises of relevance to whatever it is we're trying to design, we always try to document our process to see how it changes us. So we use these body sheets, for example. We used other methods as well, but this is one method where this is me before doing one of these exercises and this is me after doing one of the exercises. Or when, I, when we test a system that we built, we do this as well. So before you can see uh, I have a soft spine and <laughs> I don't know what, cold feet and whatnot. Uh, and I actually do talk a little bit about myself, that I'm happy and whatnot. But once I've done the exercise, I realized that I was very uneven, asymmetrical, and that through the exercise we were doing, I, I was able to sort of become more symmetrical. So as I was asking you before to focus on your feet and your knees and so on, did you feel symmetrical or asymmetric? asymmetrical? Yeah. So I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just noticing that maybe you're asymmetrical, maybe it's harming you in some way, maybe you need to attend to that part of yourself. So, um, sorry, Pavel, but I'm going to use you as an example. <laughs> so this is Pavel when he started working with us. Uh, before and after doing uh, these exercises and you see his expressions in the early phases were perhaps less detailed as you know later in the process when we were really engaging with this more heavily then I got richer 
we got richer feedback from Pavel about what he was experiencing with these systems and with these interactions. So this is one of the things you need to do. You need to change yourself. But changing yourself also means becoming more compassionate, becoming more aware of other people. Like if you don't know yourself and your own body, then how can you know your end user? How can you know what they're experiencing? So to me, this is also the basis for compassion and ethical considerations. Like if I don't know what my, how my body functions, then how can I design for somebody who's disabled or male <laughs> or young <laughs> or something like that, right? I need to know myself in order to feel and sense what other people are experiencing. So this is actually a picture uh, based on a photo where <laughs> Richard Schusterman and I are spooning together and he's trying to feel my breathing so he put a hand here on my chest because if he puts a hand on my chest he can feel my breathing, right? But I can also feel his breathing because his arm will be moving with his breathing. Uh, this was so embarrassing so I stopped breathing. <laughs> so he was like, yeah, you need to breathe. <laughs> But anyway, you don't have to get this close to do it, uh, to, to engage with other people, but it is interesting. It is interesting, the boundaries we have and what kind of things we can design, depending on how close we get. Estrangement is another one, so let's try that. What if you knepper um, händerna, uh, interlace your fingers, and then interlace your fingers the other way around? Ah, difficult, huh? How do you do that? So put the other thumb on top. So let's imagine you're designing something to be handheld uh, then between your hands like this or something. Then you need to know where your fingers are. You need to know where your thumbs are. So by making the movement that is not the habitual one, the non-habitual movement, then things can come more clearly into your mind and you can start designing with it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah? No? Yes? <laughs> uh, so uh, we, do, we do some of that. Um, estrangement things like a colleague of ours wanted us to do sourdough baking as a way of understanding how to design uh, music controllers uh, in a different way and how to experience time in a different way. Because the time is embedded in the sourdough, right? Any of you been baking? You know what you have to do? You have to move the stuff and, and then the gluten is, is dissolved and stuff happens. So the time is really between you and the sourdough. That's where the time is measured and exists. And so you can use this to then design other things than putting the bloody clock into every interface and forcing everyone to look upon time as something that is always evenly tick-tock, 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 because it isn't, right? This 45 minutes with you guys is quite different for me <laughs> than for you, I'm sure, and the 45 minutes tonight when you're going to bed uh, is quite different again from the 45 minutes now. So how do we design with that subjective experience of time? So she forced us to do sourdough baking in order to do design work, uh, ending up with quite different design stuff. So estrangement through bringing in other materials than what we're used to, to using. Um, and uh, so we try everything. Here I am laying down on a mattress for people with bed sores. You know, old people who are laying in bed for too long get bed sores. So there is this lovely mattress that they use that where little um, bubbles are inflated with air. Just move, so making the mattress move a little bit all the time. And laying on it was like, oh my God, laying on a cloud or something. So experiencing and being able to articulate the experiences I have and then use those in my design process is one of the big things we do. So heat from, uh, from something like a lamp or mattresses or whatnot, engaging with it. Right now we're building shape-changing stuff <laughs> and here we're trying to simulate what those how those could change. So here is one of, uh, one of our colleagues. He's, he's experiencing what it would feel like to have a shape-changing mattress that would be able to hug him. 
Um, so Anna and Pedro are trying to <laughs> hug him. <laughs> it looks kind of weird, but it, it's interesting. So engaging with materials, and I think uh, the materials we have now in in our field, all the smart materials we have, like interactive textiles, like heat, like uh, vibrations, like shape-changing materials, uh, combining them and figuring out other ways of engaging that moves you out of the glass screen into other forms of communication. That's where we want to go. And then we can put language and symbols back again, but first we need to understand how to engage this way. Anyway, so back to my, uh, back to my uh, manifesto. I think everybody should have a manifesto. <laughs> this, is, this is what I meant by cultivating your aesthetic appreciation and disrupting the habitual and engaging with what is familiar to you and how to design with that. So I'll just end, as I always do, with a <laughs> picture of my, one of my grandchildren. This is Alma. Uh, she's doing yoga with me. Uh, and of course, m my yoga positions do not happen as easily as hers. She is like, witch, witch, up with the leg and so on, while I'm like, oh, struggling to even get down. So I, I think I learn more from her than I learn from the books I read. Um, anyway, I have a book coming out, and I promised my editor that I would mention that, that talks about what is this soma design or soma aesthetic design. Uh, and this is a quote from, from the book on what we mean by engaging in this way and designing the future of ubiquitous computing and smart materials and drones and robots and whatnot. This is how we think it should be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to know if you have any questions. Up your hands. I'm sure you have some. Yeah. Um, they want you <coughs> to use the microphone as they yeah. are recording, so that's why. Uh, so I was thinking that um, regarding people who are tetraplegic or paralyzed, they also need to keep their muscles moving or yeah. something like this, even though they cannot do it yeah. and they cannot feel it. Do you also treat this topic or so what do you think I, about it? Yeah, I haven't designed with that, but I have uh, happened to have somebody in my family with, with this issue. And uh, yes, definitely. Um, especially if you think about children that have issues with uh, being paralyzed. To really understand the world, you have to move them into positions where they can experience the world. For example, to really understand what it means to be underneath something, you need to put the kids underneath the table. You need to allow them to hit their head into the table if they can move that much. Because a lot of the concepts, the way we organize the world, uh, even the way we understand mathematics, if you take the most theoretical uh, <laughs> subject you can think of is actually started in our spatial bodily ways of being in the world. So yeah, definitely. Okay, question. Hi Kia, thanks hey. for that. Um, are you familiar with the work of Temple Grandin? D uh, again? Tem Temple Grandin. She's a professor in farm sciences in the U.S., and she's also a high-functioning autistic individual, so she's in the autism spectrum, and she works um, from the perspective of cattle. Yeah, yeah. So she gets yeah, yeah. down on four legs, yeah. and she goes yeah. around the farm and, and, and yeah. has the, some aesthetic experience from the perspective of cattle, yes. and some of the things that she's figured out is um, cattle like to be touched and mm. caressed. Mm. So now there are these uh, spinning cylinders that allow cattle to get brushed, yes. for example. Yeah. So she does a lot of this work, and she comes from a very different perspective, mm. uh, which is her, um, the way that she thinks, yeah. being in the spectrum. Yeah. Uh, but she does the same thing, in that she's placing herself in the place of the cattle. Exactly. She's trying to experience the world in, in the way that, that cattle does. And I think some of my, my understandings of this also comes from being a horseback rider. Yes. When I'm riding, 
I do not want to be human solely, nor do I want to be a horse solely. I want to be a centaur. I want to be a being that together with the horse perceives the world uh, as a unity. So I need to think like what a horse thinks. You know, they're super scared of something in the ditch. You know, they go like, ah, there's a lion in the ditch, <laughs> <laughs> even though it's just a piece of paper. But so you have to be thinking like a horse. You have to perceive the world like a horse. But you're also human. And mm. so you're doing this joint. And the horse has been genetically modified to fit with me, right, for mm. centuries. Mm. So, so that's, yeah, that, why is it that we can, cannot engage with robots in similar ways as we engage with horses <laughs> or mm. cattle. Mm. That, uh, I think that would be interesting. Thanks. More questions from the audience? Yeah. Oh, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first, I, is that working well? Yeah. Yeah. I think you need to improve this uh, microphone. The somostatic experience of the microphone. Same design, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Firstly, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, the I, I, I thinking of I'm thinking of the concept of mindfulness, mm. uh, kind of booming concept in the psycho area. Yeah. And I think that you are actually approaching this concept in the body part. So, um, I want to you to maybe uh, talk more about the concept of mindfulness yeah. uh, and, and your way of understanding and how much yeah. it is related to this work. Uh, mm. And also, because I'm from China, I'm really interested in this kind of meditation practice. And but it's that's that's more of the psycho part. Mm. But it's very very good to see it's mm. arising in the industrial world. Yeah. 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 I think the way you practice mindfulness is always involving certain body postures and certain ways of engaging to, to ward off a lot of the, of the engagements. But um, one thing is first, is in China, you never did the stupid thing of dividing mind from body. <laughs> so that was a good thing. Uh, we unfortunately did. So a lot of the somesthetic theories are actually informed by Eastern philosophy, Chinese philosophers uh, talking about this. Uh, mindfulness is one kind of practice. I, it's, it's a particular way of engaging with yourself. Um, and yes, yeah, it's interesting as a somesthetic example, but it's not the only way. You know, I could also be designing for something where I'm running as fast as I can or where I'm drinking alcohol and having cigars. You know, I'm not limiting myself to anything that is soft and nice. Soft and nice is boring. No, but you can do that. Of course, you need to do soft and nice, you know, and you need to do mindfulness because it's good for you and so on. But you also need to experience all the other aspects of being human and moving and engaging and working, like applying yourself hard or engaging with a game that is scary or, or other. So I would just like to look at all of the experiences, the richness of all the stuff you can experience. I was like, what, 50-something when we started doing Feltenkrais exercises. And I was experiencing stuff that I've never experienced before of my own body. That's fantastic. And we're designing as if people only have this much that they can experience with, right? Ah. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's open the design space. Now that we have the materials, the sensors, the actuators, the machine learning, the you know, smart textiles, whatnot. Let's do some more cool stuff that really engages us in many ways. Yeah, but mindfulness, yes, absolutely. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I know that people have lectures to attend other, other than here. So I just want to finish off by thank you for coming here and a very interesting uh, experience. And we always give a ah, little This is lovely. Thank you. I love gifts. So Look, yeah. the art at KTH. Thanks. It's a fitting gift, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>